Thank you very much. Um, talking about movies tonight, uh, I don't know anything about transportation at all. Um, although, just by coincidence, I put up this picture from the Conquest of Canaan, which was made in Asheville in 1921, and they used uh, three of the Asheville trolleys to be, if you can see it well enough, it says Canaan Transit Company. And um, not only would it be the earliest surviving film footage of the trolleys in motion, but there's a scene that takes place on the trolley. So there's actually footage of the inside of that trolley. And that ends the transportation part of this evening. Uh, I, have, I have always been interested in movies. Almost all of my books have been on film history. And early in life, I started being real interested in how movies were made and fairly soon where they were made. I was really loved location stuff. I've had many, many great adventures searching out the locations of films that I liked. And uh, once there's a 1939 film called Beau Geste with Gary Cooper. Anybody? And um, I went looking for where the fort had been. I found it. But on the way, we were surrounded by seven Border Patrol trucks. <laughs> and. Uh, that's what happens when you cross the desert in uh, California. But we found it, and uh, we found the ground covered with thousands of LaBelle rifle shells used by the Poor Legion, thousands of them. I went back five times subsequently, and every time I went, there was more stuff. Uh, because it's sand, it shifts, it goes. Oh, when I got to Asheville, my wife and I moved here three years ago. As a matter of fact, what's today? Uh, we moved here three years ago, two days ago. So um, I immediately started looking into local film history because that's what I do. And um, I started finding that this film, The Conquest of Canaan, was referred to everywhere as being the first film made in North Carolina and certainly the first film made in Asheville. So I started looking and Eventually, I found at least 53 films made in Asheville before this one. <laughs> at least. I've cataloged nearly 400 films made in North Carolina during the silent era, which in Asheville's case extends to 1929, but nowhere else goes past 1926. But of all the cities and towns in North Carolina, what would you say was the busiest, most productive city for silent film production in other words, which city had more films made there during the silent era than any other city or town? Batcave. <laughs> Between 1912 and 1920, more than 50 films were made there. I keep hoping I'll find more, but as of now, we know of 14 films that were made in the state that survive. Now, that's a terrible, <laughs> terrible statistic, considering 400 films were made here. Matter of fact, one of my books was called Lost Films, in which I spent an entire book talking about just that, what happened to them. Many things happened to them, but mostly neglect, mostly people didn't care. And so many of the films made locally in a, in a state like this, uh, some films, like this was made by Paramount Pictures, so it was a big studio picture. And even so, there's only one print in the world that exists, and that's in Moscow. Basically, what you had is actualities, which later would be called newsreels, although they're not the same. I'll show you in a second. Um, and then locally made films. There was a whole lot of see our town films. Almost every town in the state, except Saluda, but almost every town made one of those. And they would just show, you know, the new grammar school or, hey, there's a new swimming pool being put in in the park. Or, and everyone, the fire department, every film, they loved the fire department. So there were a lot of those. And every one of them, they spoke very optimistically in the trade papers or the newspapers. They would say, these, these films of Marion are really going to go around the country and everybody's going to know what a great town Marion is. I don't know if that ever happened, but, it, but that was always the hope, that the movies would get out there, people would see the films, and they would flock to those towns and see the fire department. So, <laughs> so 
the other thing, and this, these kind are particularly interesting to me, um, are the itinerant films. There were, there were filmmakers who traveled from place to place, and they would tend to have one single script. And there was a, I'll, I'll give it as an example, a man named Don O. Newland, not Irish, O period, Newland, and he had a script called Blank Hero. So it would, he would go, he made six of them in North Carolina in 1925. Let me see if I can remember. Wilmington, Winston-Salem, Wilson, Durham, Greensboro, someplace else. There were six. Take my word for it. And it was always the same script that he would take. He would get involved with, he would get sponsorship for the newspapers and they would run a contest, which was basically a popularity contest, which would cast the movie with the most popular people in town. So if the high school prom queen is, everybody said, well, she's the prettiest one in town, so she would get a gazillion votes, and then she would get cast in the movie. And then they would go around and shoot all on location in the streets. And what I always thought was great, uh, really smart, he would shoot the interiors. There was, it was all about the same family. Um, and they would shoot the interiors of their living room on the stage of the local movie theater. So that after the feature, you'd have a full house. After the feature, they'd come out and say, now you can watch a movie being made. And they'd shoot the scene right there. And uh, of course, everybody in the movie theater would say, well, I'm gonna come see that. because I." And they would actually, at the end of it, point the camera and pan it across the, the people. So it, it was bright. Then they would, he would take it back to New York to edit it. He never figured out how to streamline that. But uh, then it would show for maybe three days and everybody in town would see it. And by that time he was off to the next one and uh, making another one. And some of those films survive, but none of the North Carolina ones do. Um, other people did the same thing. I, we can trace them back to 1910 when people started doing this. And all through the 20s, and then Newland got sound equipment, made them in the 30s. So a couple of those exist now. So they're delightful to watch. And I would love, I'd give anything to find some of the North Carolina ones, but I fear I never will. Um, then there were feature films, of course. The big studios, all the big studios came here once in a while. Paramount came several times, Metro, Selznick, and then the big uh, companies of the time, Vitagraph, Biograph, the Edison Company, uh, and certainly more about them later in a very crucial way. Um, as far as we know, the first footage shot in Asheville was also the first footage shot in North Carolina and that was in September of 1900. And it was this man, J. Stuart Blackton, with the Vitagraph Company. He was a pioneering filmmaker. He was also a pioneering uh, animator. He made some of the earliest animated films, including one called Humorous Phases of Funny Faces that is still exists and uh, is very funny, is very clever. It's just faces drawn in chalk that keep changing into something else. He was on assignment in Texas and was coming back to the Vitagraph headquarters in New York and coming through Asheville, was so taken by the mountain scenery that he just got his camera out and I, I'm assuming went to the caboose or someplace where it was just open air and just took footage. And a week later it was in theaters everywhere. That's basically what actualities were. They weren't like newsreels in that they didn't tell a story in 1900 or even before, very few people anywhere in the world had ever gone more than 50 miles from their own home. If you weren't in the military or if your business didn't take you, most people didn't go far from home. And so when movies started appearing, it was enough simply to say, look, here's a shot of Jerusalem. Look, here's, you know, here are the pyramids. It'd be a minute or 30 seconds or whatever. It was just, that was enough, moving pictures. And I'll show you one right now. This is the earliest, seems to be the earliest, uh, surviving footage made in North Carolina. It's not Western North Carolina, it's in Edenton. 
and it's called Hauling the Shad Net. And as you will see, that's uh, literally the, the plot. In the Biograph Bulletin, which is what they used to sell, they would give descriptions of each film to, to sell to theater owners or Nickelodeon owners. And in the Biograph description of this, it says, the fish are very lively. <laughs> But that's it in its entirety, and that's all that anyone required. Um, starting as early as 1895 in Asheville, movies were shot on this, which should have a screen on it, but I couldn't find a picture of it with a screen on it. But this is at Riverside Park. And starting in 1895, every weekend they would show movies on this screen, and people would sit on the, the shore on the opposite side, and watch the movies. And of course, Riverside Park met its Waterloo in uh, 1916. It was washed away in the flood of July 1916. Never rebuilt for some reason. I'm, I'm not quite sure why. A couple of interesting things. There was a, a filmmaker, local guy, and like all these local filmmakers, they did everything. His name was C.F. Ray. He had a photograph shop, so he would take portraits. When movies came along, he bought a movie camera. He also had a car rental company, and he opened a travel agency. And he convinced the revenuers to go along with his movie camera to shoot them uh, busting this still up in the mountains. And uh, D.A. Kniep, he's the earliest only survivor, and he was, uh, he was, he was in the area, we'll say that about him, but, uh, but he, was, he had nothing to do with the battle itself. Nevertheless, he's in the movie, and um, the only thing we have is that picture. That's all there is. This is another actuality slash advertising film. There were two sets of twins, the Thomas Brothers and the Penny Brothers, who went into business with each other to be auctioneers and real estate moguls. And several times they made movies of themselves which they would show all around, uh, apparently to help them. The newspapers are never very clear about what these movies are, are about. And of course, nothing survives at all. Now, this is the first, as far as I know, itinerant film made in Asheville. 1916, the uh, people making it had just made a romance of Charlotte. And when that was finished, they came down and did this. You would find in this basic, the same year, you will find a romance of movies everywhere. That's a scene, but I'm telling you, this is, uh, this is the quality of the, of the prints we have of this thing and all of the cast there. So at least I can go through, at least I was able to fill in all of the, all of the names of who was in it. Even all the children are named. Very cool, yeah. What would I give to see this film? Now, in 1925, J.B. Slim Broland came into town. And I blame him for there not being Asheville's hero because just at the time when Newland was making all the other six uh, North Carolina films, Broland came into Asheville, had also made uh, Durham's Romance just prior to this, and then came to Asheville, and he did it a slightly different way. He claimed that he had been with the Max Sennett Company. He was not. Uh, he claimed that he had show business experience. Apparently did not. But he was six foot three and 96 pounds. <laughs> and um, so, yes, so uh, he cast himself as the lead in his film. And he went to each store and establishment in town and got them to pony up to be pictured in his movie. So, while all of the itinerant films are loaded with local people and local businesses, 
and everything, he made them pay. And they did. And um, the synopsis of the film just sounds awful. Just awful. <laughs> this is George Massa, who photographed this film, was also an, uh, an Asheville photographer and uh, started making movies very early on. He, he did newsreels. He worked with Slim Broland in the two that he made in North Carolina and maybe more, we, don't, we really don't know. But his main claim to fame is he worked with the great mountaineer Horace Kephart in mapping out all of the ranges around. And there is a mountain named after Kephart and then there is a Massa Knob. He was tireless and would only work long enough to get enough money to go back out in, into the mountains with his cameras. Paul Bonesteel made a documentary about him uh, maybe six or seven years ago. He came from Japan. He came here, uh, was working at the Grove Park Inn uh, as a bellboy and waiter and, and started taking pictures and people liked that his portraits and sooner or later somebody backed him and he opened a studio. So uh, really interesting story. Died very young um, and uh, buried next to Horace Kephart. So there you go. This is a cool one. Who's who in Asheville? They did these all over the place. I've got at least a dozen North Carolina ones. And what they would do is shoot the backs of prominent people. And then you would go that night and you would write down who you think it is. And then the following week, you go and they show them from the front. And so, so you can win a prize. They did this everywhere. And in some uh, cities, they did it twice. They would come back maybe two years later and do it again. It was, uh, but it was an Asheville uh, filmmaker who did it. Now, <laughs> I, only mention, I only bring this up because it's, it's closer to here. Hendersonville, we got virtually nothing. We got when Jack Johnson was in town training. Not Jack Johnson, Jack Dempsey was in town training. We have a fragment of one of those films from 1926, but there were four films released of him. Other than that, the silent era passed Hendersonville by. This was gonna be a major film called The Rise and Fall of the Confederacy in uh, 1917. And it was made, but it was made in Greenville and Charleston, South Carolina. I've got a bunch of articles about them finding exactly the place on this farm in Hendersonville, and this is where they're gonna shoot it, and they did not. Now, another mystery. I love these mysteries. I'm counting on you to solve them for me. This is Doris Troutman. I found one article in the paper that said the film Memories of a Hobo is now complete and will begin showing soon. It stars Asheville High School senior Doris Troutman. That is literally the only thing that is ever said in the newspaper, ever. I checked all the Asheville newspapers. I checked all around day by day by day until I merely went mad. But there is nothing else about it. So there's Doris Troutman, folks, and from a play that she was in the same time. And then this was another locally made film with uh, Rose Hildebrand, who was the previous Miss Asheville, and then Miss Caroline Maxwell, who was her runner-up, but was now Miss Asheville. <laughs> they just went all over the place. They went to Chimney Rock and all over Asheville and up on Sunset Mountain and every place and just shot scenes. This is from a film from 1916 called Then I'll Come Back to You. It was based on a popular novel of the time. That's Alice Brady on the far left. And she was a great actress. Later on, she became a character actress and uh, she's in The Gay Divorcee with Astaire and Rogers. She's in Young Mr. Lincoln with Henry Fonda. Uh, died very young, died in 1939. Uh, but they made this film partly in Asheville. This is Whitehall, the, uh, the home of the newspaper editor of the time. Uh, 
His name was also Hildebrand, I believe. Um, only the beginning and ending scenes were shot at Whitehall. The rest of the movie was made in Pensacola. Uh, Claire Kibble Young was a big star at the time, and she made a great movie, well, seems to be great, uh, is gone, uh, called Heart of the Blue Ridge. She made that in Bat Cave in 1916. And this, 1917, uh, The Foolish Virgin, which was based on a novel by Thomas Dixon, who wrote Birth of a Nation. It seems to be just a uh, romance, uh, and so it's not quite uh, Thomas Dixon at his worst. But a lot of this was shot in, in Asheville, and in fact, in write-ups of the film, um, it said that every time a, an Asheville scene appeared on screen, when they showed it in Asheville, the audience would burst into applause. <laughs> and this was called The Summer Girl, and this is the Swannanoa River. And uh, this is not far from Biltmore Estate. And that, the woman's name is June Caprice. She made four films in North Carolina. And this is 1916 as well. Producer named Edward Warren came to Asheville in 1917 to make this movie, to make part of this movie, The Warfare of the Flesh. The modern story is um, a melodrama about a woman put in a, a bad position by a doctor who can uh, cure her husband of his terrible disease if she, you know, plays ball. <laughs> so it started with uh, an allegorical, as some, uh, DeMille did this a lot later in the 20s, but it started with an allegorical section set in, in biblical times. And so there was uh, Adam and Eve, and that scene was shot in Florida, and then they shot a scene in hell. And where would they go for that but Swannanoa? <laughs> so it's, it's like, but you can see the, uh, the guy playing Satan and then his daughter, she's wearing a snake dress. I love this dress, <laughs> snake skin. And um, they found a quarry in Swannanoa and they put uh, flash pots and uh, burning oil all over the place. And then when the scene started, uh, they shot off fireworks and they made smoke and, and flame and, and uh, apparently scared the living life out of the actress who was, playing the, who was playing the part, who was stuck in the middle of all this. So they were only here one day. Now, some scenes from Conquest of Canaan. In every case, you're going to see Asheville history in motion that does not exist in any way today. This is the First Baptist Church at College in Spruce. They not only shot at the courthouse, but in the courthouse. But this is literally the inside of the courthouse in Asheville. And the, uh, the jury had just finished trying a case. And the director went up to them afterwards and said, Listen, I'll give you $5 a piece if you'll stick around and be in this. So that's actually a real murder trial jury. They don't ever show Vance Monument because they don't want it to be Asheville, but uh, that's going right in front of Vance. And there's the, fire, the old fire department and the old jailhouse right, right here. I find myself pointing at the screen. And the, uh, the original fountain is there. And this is the scene where, this is all the north side of Pack Square. It's like eight, I think it's eight uh, Pack Square. And this is actually earlier in the film and it also goes by very quickly, but you'll see he rides up Biltmore, turns left onto Pack Square, goes south on Pack Square. But look fast and you'll see the Princess Theater. There's Patton Avenue, right? Just before he turned. Back to the picture that we started with. This is 4547 Biltmore Avenue. This is the Swannanoa Berkeley Hotel, which is called the National House in the movie because that's what it's called in the book. That little bit of white building jutting out there is the C.F. Ray photo 
company, which we saw earlier. And so the Vance Monument would be just around there. But as I say, they're very careful not to show it. Now, in 1914, Thomas Edison came to Asheville to make what turned out to be five two real films. Uh, he brought a troop of players, so it's the same people in all five films. And he leased property from uh, the son of Rutherford B. Hayes, the former president, uh, which is in West Asheville. It was a big place. He leased that for exteriors and then shot all over the place. They shot at Biltmore. They shot at the Manor. Shot several of the films at the Manor. Grove Park Inn, they filmed. Downtown Asheville, all over the place. This was the leading lady, Mabel Turnell. And this was Herbert Pryor, who was in all of them. And this is them, not looking like themselves, but this is somewhere around. Who knows where it is? I sure can't find any place around Asheville with big rocks and trees, so it's anybody's guess. This is a film based on a book called In Christmas Canyon. But for the, uh, for the purposes of making the film, they changed it to Across the Burning Trestle. Uh, so we do have a little bit of train stuff here. Uh, so, so your time will not have been wasted. Uh, they, one of the reviews in the trades paper said, a title like that tells you exactly what's going to happen. Why did they do this? But, uh, but they did. And this film was made right here. Now, there is one wonderful woman named Jenny Henderson. She published a book called The North Carolina Filmography. And so she was very helpful to me in finding some of these things. And I found quite a lot more. But, she, uh, but other than Jenny, I've never met anybody who knows anything about any of these films. I have become, and this is pointless bragging, I've become the world's leading expert on North Carolina silent films because no one, no one else has ever bothered to, to do it and nobody cares. So.